don't do that. All right, okay. So uh, we did a fair amount of theory, so let's try to do a few examples now. Uh, this is mostly, in fact, it's all the work I'm going to talk about is work done with Jung Hyo Jo and others. So I'm not really sure I had to fly all the way to talk about this work, but uh, let's uh, get to it. All right. So let's start with uh, some um, very simple things. So what we're interested in is uh, we observe some stochastic systems, right? And we'll assume that their spins take values plus one and minus one. And uh, there's a vector of these spins, and we observe them flipping up and down as time goes on, right? And so there's time step one, time step two, and so on, and these spins are just flipping up and down probabilistically, right? And what we're trying to do is figure out um, what are the interactions between the spins that are making them do this uh, flipping stochastically, right? So let's start with, suppose there's only uh, one spin, right? And uh, its state at the next time point is uh, stochastically determined by its state at one time, right? So I wrote down a very general probability. Uh, if sigma at t plus one has the value rho, which remember rho is just plus or minus one, right? Um, then uh, if rho is plus one, then it'll be e to the b plus w sigma t divided by two cosh b plus w sigma t. And our job is to figure out what are b and w, right? These are the parameters of the model. What are b and w? That's what we're trying to figure out, right? So um, we can look at the mean value and the covariance over a period of observation. And the mean value over some period will be, you know, you sum up all the plus ones and minus ones and you'll get a number, m. And then m will be between one and minus one, right? And we can also look at the covariance uh, of between sigma at t plus one and sigma of t, right? Now, if we expect some sort of mean field self-consistency, right, then we expect that if we plug in m into the expectation value here, that's where that tanch comes from. If I take this probability and I multiply this by uh, rho, and I sum over rho. Remember, rho is only going to take values plus one and minus one, right? So you get e to the positive b plus w sigma t minus e to the um, minus b plus w sigma t, and that's just the tanch, right? So that's the expectation value. On the right-hand side here is the expectation value uh, given m. So by, for self-consistency, we might think that m should be equal to tanch b plus wm, right? That's just sort of the mean field self-consistency. You've seen it in the easing model probably many times. Um, we can be more sophisticated and we can say, okay, this uh, uh, correlation between time t and time t plus one, right? The expectation of that should also be determined in the same way that is, the correlation between sigma t plus one and sigma t should be equal to uh, the correlation between tanch of b plus w sigma t times sigma t. So that's just intuition. So how do we derive these things? So um, what we want to do is we want to maximize the likelihood of the observed time series, right? So that's maximum likelihood. We want to maximize the probability of sigma t plus one given sigma t, okay? This isn't really a likelihood, but close enough, right? Um, so now differentiating with respect to b and w, because we want to maximize this. So uh, we differentiate with respect to b and we get this, and we differentiate with respect to w and we get this. Everyone understands where that came from, right? If I just differentiate with respect to b, I get the expectation value that was tanch, right? 
and I differentiate respect to w and I get this. Okay, so if I set this equal to zero and I set this equal to zero, right? I want to maximize, right? The maximize the maximum likelihood. So I set these both equal to zero and those equations are exactly the intuitive uh, mean field equations that we wrote down, right? Um, well, we can do better. Uh, so if I multiply this equation by m and I subtract it from the second equation, then we get dw minus mdb acting on the log of the maximum likelihood uh, is equal to the sum over all time sigma t plus 1 delta sigma t minus tanh of b plus w sigma t times delta sigma t. And delta sigma t is just sigma t minus the mean field value, right? Now, if you expand the tanh, assuming this deviation from the infield value is small, if you expand the tanh, you get 1 minus tanh squared x times delta, right? This is, this is the nice thing about tanh is that you differentiate it and you get basically a bump function, right? And that's what that is, the bump function. Um, so if I plug this expansion into this equation, then I get this relation, right? And um, if you look at this, you'll see that you can solve, well, let's see. You can solve this. If you set this equal to zero, you can solve for W. And that's the solution that you see is right here. So you see we expressed the naive mean field approximation. Um, it gives us an explicit expression in terms of our mean field expectation value and the uh, observed correlation functions. Yes? Are we clear about this? Right? Yes? Okay. Now, so that was uh, expanding tanh to first order, right? Just first order. If you expand tanh to second order, you get a better approximation that's called the thoulis anderson palmer approximation. Um, if you treat fluctuations in sigma t plus one as following some sort of Gaussian distribution, then you get what's called the so-called um, exact mean field approximation. We'll do something different, but I want you to remember that what you ended up with was W written in terms of something to do with the mean field and a ratio of covariances, okay? Just that's where these things are coming from. Um, okay, now that was just one spin. Now we're gonna take a whole vector of spins. So there'll be indices um, and matrices where this was just scalars divided by scalars, right? But conceptually, it's really all the same thing, okay. So now we have an n spin model and the stochastic update rule is just really very simple. There's sigma i t plus one, the value that we're expecting. Um, and there's a, a linear combination uh, of what we call, we'll call this the local field produced by the other spins at the location A, right? So the, the Intuitive picture is that there's a bunch of interacting spins and they're determining their, um, what their state is at the next time, right? And basically all the spins here interact in or influence each of these spins with some different weights, yes? So there's, so if we call this spin zero, one, two, three, then there's the effect on spin zero of spin two, that's W zero two, right? And we sum over all the spins at the previous time. This is time T, this is time T plus one, right? We, spin, uh, we sum over all the spins at time T and that's the summary, this local field is that summation, right? And that's how the spins at time t influence the state of the spin at time t plus one. And instead of that single number w, we now have to determine this whole matrix wij. 
Yes? But conceptually, it's really the same thing. All right. And um, again, you can calculate the model expectation value, and it turns out to be tanch of that local field, right? So the model expectation at time t plus 1 is the tanch of the local field at time t. Yeah? Are we good? All right. Okay. Now, um, tanch is always an absolute value less than 1 less than equal to 1. So that tells us that this ratio of the actual value of sigma i t plus 1, the actual observed value, right? The expectation divided by the actual value, that's always less than or equal to 1, right? Yes? We good? So what that means is that if we somehow could update our local field, in a way to be the inverse of this ratio, then this updated local field would have a value of sigma i t plus 1 that would be bigger than the previous iteration's value. Okay? So we are iter iteratively trying to improve our estimation of w i j. Right? And our way of trying to improve this is by altering the local field felt by any spin, right? And we're thinking that, okay, maybe we can improve it by, remember, tanch is a very nice function. It saturates, right? So tanch is going to go like this, right? So if I make that local field larger, it's pushing the value of tanch further out, right? Yes? So it's getting closer and closer to the desired value, plus or minus 1, right? So that's why I say it should improve it, right? On the other hand, what if you got the sign wrong, right? I'm only comparing the absolute values, right? So if I were to do it spin by spin, I mean time step by time step, I could improve it, right? But WIJ is a global thing. It applies to all time steps, right? So WIJ that you really want to end up with is sort of a consensus best WIJ. You can optimize each single time step perfectly happily make it perfect, but that WIJ has to apply to every time step, right? Okay, so now that's the intuition for why we want to update the local field like this. Um, the question is, just like we predicted uh, the mean field equations and then we derived them by maximizing the likelihood, um, we want to derive some update that looks like this, okay? This is just the intuition for why we want to push H in such a way that we go up the tanch, saturate the tanch as much as possible, okay? All right. So now we're going to derive that update rule uh, using all the fun stuff we've learned about large deviations. So it wasn't all useless, hopefully we'll use it, all right? Okay, so um, the moment generating function is going to look like this. There's J and beta. Uh, no matter what I say, don't think of beta as an inverse temperature, it's just another parameter, okay? And J is a vector of parameters, right? And what we learned was that zi, log of zi, is always going to be a convex function of any parameter that's going to occur linearly in the exponential. I think I harangued you about that enough times over the last two lectures that you will remember this, that j and beta, log of z, is a convex function of j and beta, right? We know and love the moment generating function. We like the 
cumulant generating function, which is the log of z even more, right? Okay, so uh, define this convex free energy, as I said, the log of z. And what you'll see, of course, as we've discussed, is that the derivative of f with respect to j, uh, the, this uh, parameter j, is the expectation value of spin j, okay? And the derivative of f with respect to beta is the, uh, this hi, okay? I didn't tell you what hi is. It's just some, some function, some linear function of these sigmas, okay? It doesn't even have to be linear. We'll just say it's some function of these sigmas, okay? Yes? We've done very abstract things with these things, so I'm just telling you, this is now very concrete. There are spins, there's uh, these parameters which are coupling to the spins, and we can derive our usual moments and expectation values, okay? All right. So, <clears throat> uh, one thing that I do want you to remember is that we're never assuming that there's some sort of equilibrium distribution, okay? I didn't say anything whatsoever about any probability distribution for what value sigma can have, right? I didn't say anything. We're just summing over observed configurations with this weight that I put in, this weight that's linear in these parameters j and beta, right? I didn't assume that anything was at equilibrium, that the spins were evolving in some reversible way, irreversible way, nothing at all, okay? We just have some observations. All right, now um, the free energy and the partition function that I wrote down are very explicitly differentiable, so I can use the simpler form of the Legendre differential transform, right? There is nothing that's going to give me a non-differentiable point in, in this, right? And every data set that we ever observe is always going to be finite, so there's no non-analyticity non possible if you sum over a finite number of terms, okay? It's just not happening. All phase transitions in physics happen in the infinite volume limit, okay? There are no phase transitions that are sharp at finite volume. That's because there cannot be any non-analyticity with a finite number of terms. Okay, so we can differentiate to our heart's content and we can define this dual uh, free energy which is the Legendre transform of this original free energy, okay? And they're both convex functions, Fi and Gi. Yes? Okay, um, now we can write it down explicitly what is uh, Gi. Why, why do we want to do this? Let's be clear. Why, why do we want to do this transformation? Anyone? Because this today is show how to compute the uh, rate function based on this uh, Legendre transform. The Gartner at least the theorem or whatever. Yeah, yeah, but you're just repeating what I said to you. No, you have to think. Um, the point is that J is not an observed parameter, is not an observable but the expectation value is, right? So what we're going from is j, which is a parameter we're trying to determine, to a variable that we can actually, that, that's an expectation value, okay? That's the reason for shifting from j to m, okay? It's just like if you have a spin system in a magnetic field, then you can either talk about the magnetic field you applied, or you can talk about the magnetization of the system, okay? Right? You can either talk about the energy, or you can talk about the temperature, right? So there are dual variables. In this case, for our convenience, M is more convenient than J, okay? That's the reason. Okay. Um, if I wanted to, any questions? Yes, no? Okay, so this form, I want you to note that if I set beta equal to zero, then gi is just negative of the entropy, 
Okay? So minimizing this free energy GI is exactly the same as maximizing the entropy SI. Okay? Okay, so the Legendre transform duality gives us that DGI derivative with respect to the expectation value is J, right? Just like DFI DJ was M, so DGI DMJ is J. And DGI D beta is minus DFI D beta HI, okay? This just comes, where did this come from? This just comes from the fact that G plus F is J dot M, right? So if I do DD beta of that, I get DGD beta is minus DFD beta, okay? All right. So, and just a little bit of notation, J is now a function of M, right? This is Legendre transform, right? So the J is now a function of M. And so when we write HI, the expectation value of HI, it'll be just as a function of J, which itself is a function of M. Okay. Um, yeah. So now suppose we expand this G in a Taylor series about the minimum at beta equals zero. In other words, we have some observed expectation value at beta equals zero, and we're going to expand G in a Taylor series, okay? As I said, everything is analytic. Everything is perfectly nicely differentiable, so we can do that. And there's the Taylor expansion. M star is just the expectation value of sigma at beta equals zero, okay? So there's a Taylor expansion to second order. Where's the linear term? It vanishes, right. It vanishes because of our assumption, right? So if I take this equation and I differentiate with respect to beta, term by term, right? Anything with a star means it's already uh, evaluated at m star, right? Um, so the differential derivative of, with respect to beta acts on this term and this term, um, and you get the variation in m star with respect to beta, okay? But this is just differentiating this with respect to m. Oh, sorry, with respect to beta, okay? Okay, what's the big picture here? What we're going to do is we're going to differentiate with respect to M and with respect to beta. We have a Taylor expansion on one side, right? Those derivatives commute, right? So we're going to evaluate them in two different ways and we're going to set them equal, okay? That, that's really the big picture here, okay? There's a little bit of algebra. We have this quadratic Taylor expansion on one side, right? And then we just have the definition of what G is on the other side, okay? But all we're going to do is assume that the derivatives commute. That's a very innocent assumption, right? All right. So if we do that, um, this was the Taylor expansion I wrote down, right? Um, now if we look at this term and we differentiate with respect to beta, then we see that dm d beta is this, okay? It's the connected correlation function. Remember we talked about connected correlation functions? If I differentiate with respect to parameters that are linear in the free energy, then I get connected correlation functions, right? We discussed this ad nauseum, okay? So that's what this is. This is a connected correlation function. And the second derivative, I'll remind you, is the inverse of the covariance matrix. I emphasize this from the very beginning that the second derivative of uh, the dual of the Legendre function, right, of the, in the Legendre transform is the inverse of the second derivative of the first function, right? That's, that's what we have here. This thing is D2F DJ squared, right? and it's the inverse, okay? All right, so 
Now, if I match terms on both sides, then this is actually that intuitive equation that I wanted to derive. So it gives us an explicit update rule for how these parameters w are going to be updated just based on the minimization of the free energy, okay? Yes? It's a little bit of algebra. You'll get the lecture notes. But I want you to understand the big picture of why we're doing what we're doing, okay? We just matched terms dmd beta versus d beta dm with the Taylor expansion and the definition. That, that was it, okay? So that's how we got this update rule. Did we maximize anything? No, we didn't maximize anything. All we wanted to do was look at the minimization of the free energy, okay? Now, I said H could be any function, and in fact, you can take H to have linear terms in the spins, you can have H to have quadratic terms in the spins, and so on and so forth, okay? You can carry this out as far as you want. And this systematically will give you higher and higher order contributions to this delta H. So what does this give us? Oh, wait. So I showed you how to do this iteration, right? But in any finite data set, you have to know when should you stop that iteration, okay? In all of data science, you do not want to overfit. So usually what we end up doing is we split up data into a training set and a testing set and a validation set and whatnot, right? Okay? But we're not, I didn't actually show you any place where I was trying to minimize some sort of discrepancy or cost function, right? You didn't see me minimize anything, right? So how do I know when to stop? I didn't do any splits of training, testing, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing, right? So we have to figure out when do we stop this iterative update of WIJ. Um, so look, what we want to do is we want to make our predictions, our expectation value, as close to the observed value as possible, right? That's, that's the whole name of this, this uh, game, right? We, we want to minimize the discrepancy between the observed value and our expectation value, right? And because the sigma i squared values are always plus one, right? Sigma i is plus one or minus one, so sigma i squared is one. Um, we can write this also in terms of one minus expectation divided by sigma, and the whole thing squared, right? And as we discussed, this second term here is always less than one, right? It's always less than or equal to one in, um, in absolute value, right? So every term in this discrepancy is positive, and it makes sense that what we can do is we're going to monitor this di. As we iterate, we're going to monitor di and we'll stop the iteration when di starts to increase, okay? And this is quite independent of the iteration, you know, the actual iteration that we do because I didn't try to, I didn't differentiate this and say I'm going to minimize this, right? It's a completely independent thought that there is this discrepancy, we'd like to have the best possible value for this, for the parameters in our model, right? But we never ever use this to derive how we're updating W, right? Yes? This is not magic, it's, I just want to be absolutely clear. We did not use this in updating, okay? So now, let me show you what happens. So here, um, this is the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. So the WIJ are all supposed to be, we set up some sort of synthetic data set with the zero mean and the variance of the WIJ values is G squared over M, N, where N is the number of spins, okay? 
And suppose we have lots of data. In other words, our, the number of time points we have is uh, equal to n squared. Why, where does that number n squared come from? Why is that useful? Why is that important? Because you're trying to determine a whole matrix, Wij, right? There are n squared independent entries in that matrix, right? So if you observed n squared plus one time steps, or n squared time steps, right? That should be sufficient data to determine this whole matrix, right? But if I observe only some fraction of the, that number of time steps, right? Then that isn't really enough data to determine the matrix very well, okay? So what you observe is when there is lots of data, then of course we determine our iteration gets the values of the Wij pretty well. But you'll notice that once you get to some sort of iteration, you can keep iterating. It's not getting any lower, right? The discrepancy. Oh, this is a mean square error. And the other curve, the light curve, is the discrepancy, okay? Um, on the other hand, when there isn't enough data, then actually the discrepancy and the MSE start to increase as you overfit, right? As you overfit, the accuracy of your predictions gets worse, right? So we really need some way to know when to stop, okay? Now the mean square error would be nice, but we don't know what the real value is, right? We don't know what the real answer is. So we can't really use the mean square error to decide when we're going to stop iterating. However, we do know what the discrepancy is, right? We, we, we observe these spins, so we can calculate the discrepancy. We have our predictions, we have the observed spins, we can stop our iteration when D reaches its minimum, okay? And this is what you get if you stop when D reaches its minimum, okay? Um, now I'm comparing here five different methods for determining the Wij. Our method is the one in black, that's the FEM. Maximum likelihood is the one in red. Exact mean field is in green. The Thales anderson palmer equations are in blue. And naive mean field is there in, in sort of pinkish, right? And you'll see that as we go to very little data, right, that our method does better than the other methods as you go to very little data. That's what the, the x-axis is L over n squared, right? So when you have very little data, then our method does better than the other methods that we checked. Why, why do I keep hopping on very little data? Because I work in biology, okay? Biological systems are extremely complicated and we never have, I don't care what anyone says about big data, there is never enough data to fit the models, the complexity of the models, okay? So our effort is to try to do the best with the inadequate data that we have, okay? So it's important for us that we're not wasting any of the data as a, you know, separating the data into a testing set, a validation set, a training set. It is actually important to use all the data, okay? Yes? So that's the reason why I keep harping on how do we stop the iteration without using any of the data for validation or testing. Yes? Okay? All right. So to summarize, um, this is our local field. I told you only about a quadratic, about a linear dependence on the previous time. You initialize it with a random W, you update like this. Um, this is the exact Wij update. It's the correlation function inverse times this expectation value that you know how to compute now and you repeat this, these steps until the discrepancy starts to increase, and you do this independently for every um, spin, okay? Okay, so that's the algorithm. 
but that was with the Sherrington Kirkpatrick uh, model, which, you know, it, theorists love it because you can do all sorts of nice uh, expectation values with Gaussian random variables, especially when you have random matrices with Gaussian entries. You can do all sorts of fun stuff with them. Um, the problem is that um, real data rarely has distributions that look like that. So I had asked, like, what are the asymptotics of your, uh, uh, of your algorithm? The problem is I never get to see the asymptotics because there's always a finite amount of data. And I don't know what the coupling distributions are, so I can't derive nice central limit theorems for how do the couplings behave in the asymptotic regime where you have infinite amounts of data. For example, Suppose we take a, a, this is a generator, a synthetic uh, coupling matrix. So what we did was we made something that had a histogram of couplings that's very far from Gaussian or random. Um, it, it's these spikes, okay? The, the couplings become weaker as you head out. And if you simulate this as an easing model, this is the raster of time series that you get, okay? Nothing very predictable here. So our question is, if I give you some little amount of this data, how well can you predict the correct Wij? Okay? So these are three sequences where we get more and more and more data, and you'll see that this kind of uh, time series, from that you can still infer the coupling matrix pretty well. Okay? Now, this, this is a, a more, even more interesting one. This picture, this is the first baby with autism who's um, in, in the US, there's a baby food formula uh, company called uh, Gerber, or Gerber, I should say. And so what we did was, this is the first autistic baby whose photograph was used as the Gerber baby of the year, okay? So we took that photograph and we converted it to a matrix, right, Wij, right? And the histogram of couplings looks like this. And you can simulate it, and this is what the raster plot looks like, okay? And now I give you some little bit of this raster and I ask you, how well can you reconstruct the couplings? And this is the answer. As you get more and more and more couplings, you can reproduce the photograph better and better. Okay? So, sorry, yes. Again, sure. I, I don't know what the WIJ is, right? The Sherrington Kirkpatrick model assumes that WIJ are random variables, okay, which are normally distributed and which have a certain variance, g squared over n. Okay, I don't want to use that kind of really nice coupling matrix. So I said, okay, let's come up with um, weird couplings, right? What should WIG be? We basically pick a random matrix. Well, not too random because actual data in the real world has pretty strong correlations, okay? So this is, I'm just showing you the histogram of coupling strength versus, um, you know, how many entries have coupling strengths like that, okay? That's this coupling matrix represented as a picture, right? And then I simulated this as a stochastic easing model, and this is the kind of time series you get, right? Now I give you some little portion of this time series and I ask you, what is the coupling matrix? So the whole game is, can we reproduce, how close can we get to the actual coupling matrix, right? And this is, I'm just telling you, as you get more and more data, you can come pretty close to the coupling matrix. And this is all you're observing, is time series like this, okay? And for the second one, all we did was take this photograph and use the uh, pixel, you know, grayscale 0 to 256, or 0 to, as the coupling strength, right? And that's the time series we generated, and from this time series, we're trying to reproduce the photograph. That's all, okay? Yeah. Okay, 
as I said, the H doesn't have to be linear in the sigma. You can have quadratic, higher terms, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just showing you that if you have linear and quadratic terms, you can still reproduce them, okay? Okay, now, since we want to do big data, the question is, um, how efficient is this, right? Because somewhere there has to be a catch, right? Okay, but here's the fun thing. I showed you the update. Um, if you notice, it's not actually, you see that update, right? It's kind of a multiplicative update. It's not like delta W is this, right? I'm just telling you W nu is this factor times the old W, right? That's a multiplicative update, okay? So it's not taking an, a, a little step it's not doing some kind of gradient descent trying to minimize anything. Because first of all, we didn't find, we didn't write a cost function that we were trying to minimize, right? So this is a multiplicative update. So if you think that there's some sort of valley that you're trying to minimize, right? This update is kind of bouncing around, okay? It's not trying to go down this valley. It's kind of bouncing around, right? So there are benefits to this bouncing around, as in if you did maximum likelihood and tried to minimize, then you take a lot more iterations than our update, okay? The computation time for maximum likelihood estimation is oh, roughly 100 times bigger than the multiplicative up update that we had, okay? All right, okay, so um, I like real data. So far I was showing you just, you know, fake data, right? I mean, I simulated a time series and I reproduced the coupling. So, what, yes, sorry, question. I believe that. I believe that. Um, I, 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 I agree with you. The thing was that I did not actually ever minimize a cost function. That's actually the important thing for me. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, this is uh, real data. Uh, people actually took a salamander and they uh, wired or they, uh, they uh, put electrodes uh, or they measured the spiking of neurons in the salamander's retina when this retina was shown a movie of a fish, okay? Salamanders eat fish, so, or at least small fish. So um, the salamander's retina was getting excited, and this is the neuronal spiking in the salamander retina. And um, so we inferred the network of interactions in the neurons, and this is the predicted neuronal spiking uh, versus, uh, what was it? Yeah, if you select, okay, I don't want, I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically this is the actual neuronal spiking and this is the predicted neuronal spiking, okay? Um, and uh, this is the inference accuracy, uh, random, actually I don't know what random means, but um, so this is the large WIJ based spiking, meaning if you only look at the large, um, core, um, large interactions, large coupling strengths, then this is the inference accuracy, okay? Um, more data, yeah. Uh, this is a more uh, fun data set, if you like. Um, currency fluctuations are kind of hard to model. There's a lot of money to be made with currency fluctuations. Um, so the, we took some currencies, I forget how many, I think there are something like uh, 11 
currencies. And uh, so what we did was we uh, got data from the Bank of Italy, I think the Reserve Bank of Italy. Their website had data about currency fluctuations or currency rates. And so what we inferred was the interaction matrix at different times, okay? In different time periods, okay? And what you'll observe, kind of interesting, this is why you want to be able to do things with very little data, okay? Is because if you use all the data for these 17 years, 2000 to 2017, right? Okay? Then these are the correlations that you get, okay? This is from the actual data, okay? But if you look at uh, two-year chunks, right, then what you'll notice is that there are much stronger correlations, okay? So if you can actually infer couplings with very little data, right, that's actually more useful because the couplings themselves could be modulated on longer-term time scales, right? Economies go up and economies go down, right? So it's important to get bigger correlations out of little, out of, you know, small amounts of data. Um, and to show you, this is what the data looks like if you binarize it. Binarize means just that um, you convert it to, you know, plus minus one, depending on whether the currency went up or it went down. Yeah? Okay. Um, and then uh, Ty uh, proceeded to ask, can you make a profit in, uh, with our predictions, right? So these are just plots showing with, uh, um, uh, so first he did, okay, these are our predictions. Uh, the black shows just trading every day depending on whether your signal was to um, buy or sell, depending on which, which currencies you wanted to buy and which currencies you wanted to sell, okay, right? So this was the cumulative profit. Then he said, okay, the discrepancy that we're calculating, right? That discrepancy actually tells us, are we doing a good job fitting or not, right? So then he proceeded to set up a trading strategy where you only make a trade if the discrepancy measure is saying that you're doing a good job fitting, right? And it's kind of cool that if you do that, then there are smaller fluctuations. You end up at roughly the same spot, but you don't have these um, big drawdowns, right? It's a little more monotonic when you use the information about are you doing a good job fitting to actually decide whether you're going to trade or not, okay? And the profit per transaction is higher if you use your discrepancy measure to tell you when you know that your model might be working correctly, right? Okay, so that's that. Okay. Any questions here? Because now I proceed. Yes. Right, the currencies are actually continuous numbers, right? But what we did was we converted them to did the currency with respect to a base currency, I forget which one we took, the euro or the dollar, okay? Did it go up or down relative to that base currency? So the, it, the whole, you know, continuous fluctuations get converted to just a binary variable, plus or minus one. Yes? Okay. Okay, so now um, we want to do hidden variables. Why hidden variables? Because, as I said, I work in biology, and no biological system that's actually living and even dead can you actually observe everything that's going on, okay? So it's very important to know, are there hidden variables that are affecting the dynamics that you're actually observing? Yes? Right? And so the question with hidden variable models is, Okay, if I allow you any set of hidden variables, any type of interactions of hidden variables, right, then I can fit anything as well as I want, okay? It's only, it's not a well-defined problem if I say 
there are hidden variables, use any interactions you want. Okay? So in any hidden variable model, you have to have some restriction on what sort of interactions you're allowed. Okay? And then you can say, how many hidden variables do I need? Okay? So there are two separate issues here. A, you have to restrict the form of interactions that the hidden variables have. And you have to determine how many hidden variables you need. Okay? It's totally useless to say I'm going to allow as many hidden variables as I want. Okay? That's not a predictive model. So these are the two things we have to do is find the interactions of the observed and the hidden variables and we have to find the number of hidden variables. Okay, that's what I just said. So what we did was we used that same algorithm that I described to you. Um, we used that to um, make synthetic data. Again, this is the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And we said, okay, suppose you observe only 60%. The question is, with observing just the 60%, what's the error in your predictions? And you can see there's quite a bit of error if you only observe 60% of this, right? So this is the predicted coupling matrix, and this is the error. This is the actual coupling matrix. And this is the raster that you use to sim simulate it from this coupling matrix, okay? On the other hand, if you use hidden variables, then this is our predicted coupling matrix and this is the error, okay? So with, with hidden variables, you can really make much better predictions, okay? But there are all sorts of tricks, not tricks, I mean, there are all sorts of subtleties, so I wanna go over what you have to do to get this kind of result, okay? Okay, this is just showing you uh, out of naive mean field, the Thales Anderson Palmer equations, exact mean field, maximum likelihood, and free energy minimization. Uh, how well do you reproduce? Okay, observed to observed couplings, hidden to observed couplings, observed to hidden couplings, and hidden to hidden couplings. Okay, all these have to be inferred. Yes, question. Sorry? Yes. Yes. Th then you need, yeah. No, no, I'm going to show you how you have to determine the number of hidden variables. So as I said, that's, that's a very important thing. If someone says, I can solve hidden variables, but cannot tell you how many hidden variables, that's not useful. So yes, the, actually the hard part here was to figure out how to determine the number of hidden variables. That's the, the $100 question or the $1,000 question. How many hidden variables, okay? All right, uh, so we get the, uh, the predicted interactions versus the actual interactions reasonably well, um, right? And it's, it's very critical for this, see, the, expectation maximization algorithm, there are two steps, right? The maximization step is where we're using the free energy minimization. The expectation step is the same as any other algorithm, okay? So if you can do that faster, right? If you can do the finding the couplings faster, that is when you can use a hidden variable model. Because the hidden variables require a lot more computation, right? Because you have to simulate them from your maximization, okay? And you didn't observe any of them, so there's a lot of sampling involved. So if you can do this faster, then, then you have a chance of determining the hidden variables, okay? So it's very important here to be efficient in determining the hidden variables. Um, okay, so now this was the question, how many hidden variables, okay? 
This is just a summary of the algorithm. Um, OK, I'm going to tell you the answer, and then I'll try to motivate why we have this answer. Um, so remember, we had a discrepancy, right? We defined a discrepancy, which was basically the deviation of our prediction from 1, right? The ratio, the deviation from the actual observed value, squared, summed over, right? That was the discrepancy D. Um, when you have hidden variables, then what's the discrepancy? You don't know what the value was, right? You don't know what the hidden variable state was. So what you can't really use the discrepancy of the hidden variables to decide how many to use, right? Or where to stop the iteration, okay? So the measure we came up with was calculate the discrepancy of the visible variables, right? And then scale it up to take into account how many hidden variables there were, okay? So if you look at this, this is NH, number of hidden variables, plus the number of visible variables, right? Divided by the number of visible variables, right? Yes? So on top, and the numerator that is hidden plus observed variables, the total number of variables divided by the visible variables, okay? And the intuition for this, and there's no derivation that I can tell you, the intuition for this is simply that the discrepancy in the hidden variables cannot be bigger than the discrepancy, cannot be less than the discrepancy in the visible variables, right? Does that make sense? If there's errors or uncertainty in what you observed, right? If you inferred some hidden variables, there can't be less uncertainty in the hidden variables, right? That's just error propagation, if you like. Yes? So this um, is the measure we used. And so qu the question is, can this predict the right number of hidden variables by minimizing this discrepancy? OK, so <clears throat> the mean square error, which again, remember, in real data, you never have the mean square error. But this is synthetic data, hidden variables 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, and this is the discrepancy of the observed. This red line is the discrepancy of the entire data set with our scaled um, discrepancy. And so you can see that it's picking out the right number of hidden variables if we look at the minimum of the scaled discrepancy that I mentioned. Yes? OK? So that's our whole algorithm is to use the scale discrepancy to figure out what the right number of hidden variables is, okay? Now, I have to tell you that this is synthetic data, and it's very clear what the hidden variable number is, okay? The reason for working with real data is you'll see, I'll show you in real data, it's not that clear, okay? But you can still see that it goes down, and there's roughly a range of hidden variables that you need, okay? but it won't be quite as clean as this is, okay? All right, uh, so in this, Ty moved on to uh, uh, considering uh, stock market data. Uh, I guess currencies did not hold his interest that much. Anyhow, so he picked 25 large US companies and he followed their, he got data for their stock prices uh, fluctuations, right? Stock price fluctuations. This is the raster, what it looks like. There are stock price fluctuations. Um, again, he binarized this, taking into account, uh, did it increase the stock price or did it decrease, okay? So that's all he's trying to predict, is, is the stock price going to increase or decrease, okay? That's, that's all he's going to use. Um, and we don't know what the hidden variables are in this model if there are hidden variables in this data. Um, so he computed the WIJ and so on and so forth. And you'll see that the number of hidden variables comes out to be like between five and six, something like that, right? 
Uh, again, it, in this case, it comes out to be about four. And you notice this is in different uh, time intervals, right? This is 2014 to 2016. This is 2016 to 2018. Um, the predicted covariances versus the actual covariances. Um, and then he did uh, simulated trading, including with hidden variables, including without hidden variables, and including no inference at all. That is just random trades. Now you have to have some baseline, right? You cannot just say, oh, I did great. What's the baseline? You know why? Look, even the no inference trade does great. Why? Because for the, there are certain periods where the whole stock market is going up. It's not like you've become smart. It's just that the whole stock market is going up. So you can do all the trades you want and you'll make money. It's, you're not a genius. The whole stock market is going up. Okay? So um, even without any inference, you know, there was a period between 2000 and 2018 where you made money. Okay? But if you do make a model with the hidden inference, then it does a little bit better. Okay? Again, he used the discrepancy to come up with a strategy for when he should trade, right? That's important. You should know when your model fits so that you know that you can trust the prediction or not, right? Um, okay, and so this is just showing you trading on certain days, trading every day, profit per transaction, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> salamanders and fish again, in this case, uh, he took some of the uh, neurons and he hid them, right? This is real data. You can take some of the uh, variables and say, okay, suppose I assume that I didn't observe them, right? Then you, then you want to reproduce what you hid, right? Um, and again, he could show that uh, if you, you can determine the number, he took four of the strong neurons, strongly connected neurons, and he uh, kept them aside so that we didn't know what they were. And you can roughly predict how many of the strong variables there were. And if you include them, then you get a slightly better prediction than if you didn't include them, okay? These are the four that he left out, okay? Um, this I'm going to skip because, um, well, okay, let me explain this. This is, you, you can't have any person talking about data without showing you MNIST, right? This, it's just, it, there's a law or something. Anyhow, what we're trying to do is we take the MNIST digits and we ask, um, are there hidden variables in predicting this, the, the uh, pixels, right? Okay, this is not time series data, this is just what are the interactions between the pixels that make up these digits, okay? Now, in this case, he used, um, it's not quite in the same framework as before. What he said was, each of these digits is going to determine um, some num the state of some number of hidden variables, but the hidden variables are constrained that only one of them can be one and the rest are zero. Okay, so this becomes now a classification or a clustering problem, okay? But it's not in the exact framework of what we've been talking about. What it is, is in a framework where there is this constraint that only one of the hidden variables is active at any time, okay? In that case, he found a discrepancy that came up with 60, the number of hidden variables on the order of 60. Now that's interesting because if I say that the hidden variables are constrained to be only one of them active at a time, right? That's basically a clustering problem, okay? So what he found was that the number of clusters predicted was about 60. Now you could say, well, these are pretty much random. What do you mean 60 clusters? There's only 10 different types of digits, right? But it turns out and this I have no explanation for, that most of the digits occurred in about six clusters each. Okay? But anyhow, so there's our 60 clusters, and you'll see there's slight 
differences between how the digits are in the shapes in each cluster, okay? All right, okay. So the last topic I wanna to talk about is the hidden variables were of this type. Um, the hidden variables look like this. These are your observed variables, these are your hidden variables. Right? So you either observed all of them and you didn't observe all of these, right? You didn't observe any of these, right? But you observed, what you observed, you saw all of it, okay? Now what I'm gonna talk about is what if there are missing variables, okay? So suppose you didn't know and these are different for different time steps, okay? The number is different how many are missing is different, okay? So it's not like there's a block of hidden variables that you just don't know. It's just that there are hidden missing values, right? And this happens a lot in clinical data where a patient didn't show up for a test, et cetera, et cetera. So there are missing values or the test didn't go right. There are missing values, right? Okay, so the question is, can you fill in these missing values? Okay, so it's a hidden variable problem, but it's much more irregular than the hidden variable problem that we were talking about, okay? All right, um, so <clears throat> we still use the EM algorithm, um, and uh, uh, maybe in this case, I, I will explain what, how we update. Um, and, but we do need a different stopping criterion because there's no simple scale argument, right? Given how this data is randomly distributed, the missing values, you can't really say that, oh, there are this number of hidden variables and so I'm gonna scale up the discrepancy in this way. There's no simple scaling of what the, that is going to determine the number of hidden variables. There is no number of hidden variables, the data just has missing values, right? Okay. Um, so the key point that uh, Sang Won Lee and um, uh, Professor Joe's work with me did was uh, they figured out that the discrepancy in the missing data should be equal to the discrepancy in the observed data. Why is that? Because when you're filling in these values, right, that are unknown, right, you can't fill them in better than you're predicting the observed values, right? It's again sort of an uncertainty propagation. There's no way that you can predict what you didn't see better than you predict what you did see, okay? So let me show you that that tells you when to stop iterating Okay, so now I'm gonna explain. Uh, now we, we just solve this linear equation as a regression, logistic regression, which is maximizing the total likelihood. Okay, so when we are just directly solving this by logistic regression, and as Professor Mehta said, if you directly solve it, then it is maximizing the total likelihood, okay? Um, so for missing data, the stochastic update is first assign random values to the missing entries, then find WIJ, then stochastically update the missing values. You, this is the part that's sort of tedious and you have to do it step by step. You look for the likelihood that what happens if I switch the sign of one of the variables uh, does the likelihood go up or down? And you stochastically reassign the value that you've imputed, right? The value that you're uh, guessing, right? Uh, depending on the probability of the positive sign or negative sign, right? The ratio of these probabilities, right? So that's how you update these missing values. 
That clear? Yes? No? Here's the, the, the point, because this might, might be confusing. Um, if I take these spins, right, there are n spins, suppose this one was missing, right? I don't know what its value is, but I've guessed some value, right? And I did the iteration, and I have a new value of Wij, right? My coupling matrix. Now I say, OK, what if I had the opposite sign? If I flip that missing value, right? Does the likelihood of the step after and the step before, right? Does that increase or decrease, right? And so you look at this ratio of likelihoods, and if it's high, then you have a higher chance of updating it to that value, right? And if it's low, then you have a higher chance of updating it to the opposite value, right? So it's a stochastic update. Yes? Just based on the step before and the step after at any given time step, OK? OK, so for synthetic data, so as I was saying, the, de the discrepancy in the observed versus discrepancy in the missing. And you'll notice that the number of iterations where this crosses is 5. And that's where the mean square error in the predictions is also roughly the lowest. Okay? This is when 30% of the data is missing. This is when 50% of the data is missing. This is when 70% of the data is missing. And you'll notice that if I keep iterating beyond the correct number of iterations, okay, then I end up overfitting, right? So like in this case, you see that we should have stopped at 20, right? And that's where it roughly crossed the observed versus the missing discrepancy, right? But if I keep iterating, then I'll end up here where I've clearly overfit the data. Yes? The couplings have become stronger than they need to be. OK, so it's very important to know when to stop. OK. Um, mean field expectation maximization versus the stochastic update that I talked about. Um, an interesting thing to look at is how well are you predicting the correlation that's actually observed. The correlation between the spin at time t plus 1 and the spin at time t, this is something that you can measure in the data set, right? Um, so how well are you predicting that? Um, this is wij inferred, wij true. This is a nice theoretical measure, but you can never observe this. You don't know what wij is, OK? So this is for synthetic data, you can draw this plot. For real data, you can never draw this plot. You don't know what wij is, OK? But you can observe dij, right? And this is telling you that dij restored versus dij true is pretty good, OK? And as you'll observe, if 70% of the data is missing, there's a lot more uncertainty in how you restored the data, right? OK? Um, this is an accuracy measure, restoration accuracy, and this is just showing you mean field expectation maximization versus the stochastic update that we did. Um, and uh, this is the slope of uh, th uh, basically the same thing in terms of the uh, as you get more and more missing data. Obviously, if there's 80% of the data is missing, nobody is going to do very well. OK? All right. Um, and you can do the same thing for very strong and very weak couplings. Um, so this is, uh, uh, let's just go on. It, it's just, it's a measure. See, look, if you have very weak couplings, then it's almost impossible to fit, OK? Uh, if you have very strong couplings, then it takes a lot of iterations, and it's not so clear where the observed and the missing discrepancy is, OK? That's just, you know, baby steps for 
this is all synthetic data, so you don't take it too seriously, whether you do well or you don't do well. Okay. Um, it is important for us to always worry about how much data you needed. So this is a question, remember, L is the number of time steps you observed, N is the number of spins, so L over N squared is a good measure of how large the data was relative to the complexity of the model. Um, so if you notice that our, we stopped the iteration at about six iterations, but the lowest RMSE was down here at about three iterations, right? But the mean square error is not something that you can get on real data, right? So our, it, there may be a better way to stop the iterations, but I, we don't know what a better way is. But ideally, for very little data, we'd want to stop around three, right? But our measure does not stop around three. We stopped around six, okay? When there's lots of data, then, you know, anybody could do it, okay? You don't, you don't really worry about how many iterations because once you get past 10 iterations or 12 iterations, you know, it's not going to get any worse, right? So really the only check of an algorithm is what happens with very little data or in hard, you know, inference circumstances, okay? Okay. Um, the last thing I'll show you is um, neuronal spiking. This is now real data. Um, K of T is a probability of K sp simultaneous spikes. So you have N neurons, right? They're spiking. And you have this collective statistic. K of them spiked together at the same time. Okay? So K is this number. It's either one or zero, right? Oh, sorry, it, it, there's either K neurons that spiked at the same time or not, okay? So it's a simultaneous spiking statistic, and you calculate this for all the time step, and you get a histogram, right? You get values of K for each time, yes? And then you can do a probability of K simultaneous spikes. So there's a histogram. So... Um, there's the original data, P of K, that's the black X's. Uh, there's our algorithm, those are the blue circles. There's EQEM, uh, there's mean field, and there's just taking the frequency, okay? And EQEM stands for equilibrium expectation maximization. Um, and what you'll see is that the collective statistic is uh, best reproduced by our, max, our uh, stochastic update. Um, that's pretty much it. What's interesting is uh, there's the actual time series, there's the mask time series, the blue indicates what was not observed, um, and this is the restored time series, okay? Yes? Here's an interesting thing. You want restoration accuracy? Guess what does best on restoration accuracy? This frequency thing, right? What is frequency? It's just saying, I'll look at a neuron, I'll see how frequently it spikes, right? And I'll take the most frequent value and fill in all the missing values with that most frequent value, okay? And that has the highest restoration accuracy. Why? Because a lot of the neurons are silent most of the time. Okay? But that same frequency filling in does terribly for the collective statistic, right? And that's natural, right? Because collective statistics are not just a question of are they all silent or you know, are they all spiking at the same time? Okay? Um, okay. Uh, and that is it for today. All right? So, questions? Yes, please. So, in your initial slides, you, um, you said 
Yes. Yes, but uh, the fundamental entities you have defined here uh -huh. on the equilibrium step, and you also have the preemptive minimization. Yes. So I am wondering if I am working with a system far from equilibrium, mm -hmm. how can these things be valid? Or okay. Or need uh, as we discussed this after the first lecture, I'm just using the mathematical framework of statistical physics, okay? So I never ever used anything to do with equilibrium. There's not a single equation I wrote down that actually assumed anything other than convexity and natural parameters for the operators I introduced. In the, exp in the exponential. Never ever will you see anything on my slide that actually uses anything other than the mathematical framework of statistical physics. So, but the mathematical framework of equilibrium structure? No, it, it, the mathematical framework is, when I say mathematical framework, I'm talking exactly about the sum of exponentials with linear parameters multiplying operators. That sum has all the properties I need. Convexity, right? And, con and uh, that's pretty much all that's used is the natural parameters in an exponential sum. When you say equilibrium, right? you have in mind something dynamical, right? But I never ever, I mean, all the stuff you heard from Professor Lee, for instance, right? There he was actually using the time dependence and what was observed and so on, right? I didn't use any of that. Not, not anywhere. I can go over the whole equations with you. You know, never ever do I use anything to do with the concepts of equilibrium statistical physics? And the free energy minimization, is it still valid for any system far from equilibrium means free energy normal minimization is it still valid? It's, the free energy is a convex function, right? The, what I defined this formal free energy is a convex function, right? If it's a convex function, it ha and it's analytic in this particular case, it has a minimum, right? I expand in a Taylor series about that minimum. Why shouldn't I? No, I, I want, this is, this is a good question. I, I want you to understand that really, I'm a physicist and I assure you this has absolutely nothing to do with statistical physics other than the mathematical framework. So in general sense we can have free You can call it whatever you want, right? I could call it, you know, I don't know what, uh, widget minimization, right? As long as the widgets have the mathematical property that I want, I could define you know, this is the widget function and there's a dual widget function from the Legendre transform of the widget function, right? Everything would still be true. You have this cognitive dissonance because you know statistical physics and you say, he's doing garbage, this is not statistical physics. I, I, I totally understand your, your, your point of view. I'm just trying to tell you that all we used was the mathematics, not any of the physics. Okay. Maybe make it what else to get a picture that there is an overarching mathematical description of which statistical physics is an instance. Yes, that is absolutely and true. And there are other kinds of applications which are not directly related to statistical physics, but the fact that you know statistical physics makes you recognize this as a knowledge to that, but there is a broader View of all this, which language is shared, if I'm yeah, you know, that's absolutely right. See, 
why, why, did, why did we come up with this? It's because Professor Joe is a physicist, I'm a physicist, we work in physics, we used to work in physics departments, okay? So yeah, it doesn't, to be honest, I learned about large deviations much later, after we already did this work, okay? And then I'm saying, oh, look, wait, large deviations, they're doing the same things. But I, you know, because I'm old, I actually learned this stuff from reading Julian Schwinger's papers. Julian Schwinger basically invented all of modern quantum field theory in the 40s, and he introduced all these concepts. Introduce a source, notice what happens when you do a duality transformation in the source, et cetera, et cetera. So I came at it from the point of view of quantum field theory. And then I, you know, discovered that large deviations provides the mathematical justification for all this. Okay? Now, I totally understand your confusion. I use these words. Maybe I should start calling it widget function or something. I don't know. Okay? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the, if I understand this correctly, that, that's what I tried to explain was that if the couplings are being modulated on a longer time scale, right, then being able to, um, then being able to infer things for sh with little data on short intervals, right, lets you learn the modulation of the couplings, right? But if the couplings themselves are changing on the time scale that it, you know, of the data you need to infer them, then I'm not sure you can, did I understand your question right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So then I'm not sure you can In do the it. the case of a stock market. Yeah. And uh, your uh, estimation was very good in the short time scale. The yes. Yes, no, that, that's the same thing I would say for the currencies, okay? I mean, you know, because these are macroeconomic trends, right? And, and different countries have different levels of inflation or other stuff, and this takes a while for it to percolate, right? Like trade relations between countries don't change overnight. They change over the course of years and geopolitical events and whatnot, right? So if you're able to modulate, if you're able to infer with small amounts of data, then you can update your model more frequently, right? That, that's the take home message. Being able to do things with little data is very useful. Yeah, of course. Yes. No, 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 no. In fact, it, it, uh, maybe I should have emphasized that. These are all asymmetric couplings. So it's very far from equilibrium because if you had equilibrium, then Wij would have to be symmetric. Okay? In, in fact, that's a very interesting thing that these Wij's are actually asymmetric. Never did I write down an easing model like symmetric interaction. Never. Okay? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, so please. Can you, what can you see from the Western attention? Sorry? Does it lead you to show us in many, many of the Western attentions? Uh-huh. What, 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 kind, what can you see from the, what kind of information from the Canada from the Western attention? I, I, I don't think I'm getting the question. Ah. Yeah, so you mean, it, what, if, <clears throat> what if it wasn't a time series? Is that the question? Uh, I talked mostly about time series, time steps, but we did this inference also for, um, not in this, this set of papers, but 
Um, we actually did this for protein sequences, for instance, my postdoc and I. And there's no time there. You just have these observed protein sequences and you're trying to predict, you know, which, in, which residue at which position is interacting with some other residue in the, you know, uh, alignment of different sequences for the same family of proteins. Is that what you have in mind? I think the question is about once you have restored your time series, yes. what kind of other information you acquire from those time series? From those ah, time series. ah. Is that, is that the question? Yeah, maybe. Okay, but, but those, what I was trying to show was that the, like the stock market um, trading, right, that involved, that used the hidden variables that we inferred. So that's a, if you like, that's a restored time series with the hidden variables. So you get much better predictions if you take the hidden variables into account. And, and you get much better predictions. That was the P of K histogram I showed. You get much better predictions if you figure out what these missing values in the neuronal spiking were. Yes, you, you get much better accuracy in prediction. Yes. Oh. Time, time is <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. So what we did is we bend the spikes. Okay. So we have a time interval and we bend the spikes. So like in this five seconds, if there was a spike, we say that was a one. If there were no spikes, we say it's a minus one. Right? Um, no, actually, that's not a good biological reason at all, because there's no way that your neurons are going step by step by step, right? But that's a matter of because the way we've been updating, we're not making <coughs> independent stochastic uh, simulations of each neuron, right? Okay, so so that's why, and in any I, I, we've actually been doing work with um, MEG data, okay? And that is much finer time scale resolution, okay? MEG data of the human resting state brain, right? Um, but even in that case, you know, the experimental resolution is something like 2000 hertz, okay? But it's still a finite resolution. So that's a so-called continuous time series of MEG data, right, on 168 or 240 sensors, right? But it's still, you know, if they give it to us, it's a, it's a bunch of numbers at, you know, specific times, right? So it's never, uh, this idea that we have that we have continuous data, any data that you're given to analyze is never continuous, right? So that, then, you know, the binning is not, I didn't bin it. <laughs> the data is given to me as a, um, numbers at specific times, right? Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Yes, please. How do you measure the difference in the difference in the Sorry? How did you measure the difference in the Because it is not a sensitive thing. Ah, yes. The, the <clears throat> For the MNIST data, um, the, there's no time series. It's just these. So then we actually assumed W was symmetric, right? And, and that's, that's what we were doing. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, sorry. Um, for the imputation, the imputation is only Yes. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, for instance, in the MEG data that we're modeling, uh, that I'm not going to talk about, um, we are actually uh, combining uh, this kind of binary variation with actually figuring out the magnitude. The, the intuition is this, and, and you should 
think about that a little. That suppose you have a stochastic time series, right? If you can actually predict when it crosses zero, when the derivative crosses zero, whether the derivative is positive or negative, right? If you could predict that discrete event with some confidence, right? Then you probably understand the whole time series reasonably well. If you can predict stochastically whether the derivative is going to be positive or negative, right? then you can probably predict the whole continuous time series reasonably well. And that actually turns out to be true. That even if you just, you know, try to predict just the change in the sign of the derivative, right? You can actually end up figuring out the interactions that determine the whole thing. Yeah, then, in fact, when we observed that these uh, currencies were, you know, we were predicting them correctly, even though these are continuous variables, we were just binarizing them, right? That's what led me to think that maybe if we can just predict when the derivative changes sign, that's enough information to actually predict the whole time series. And it turns out to be pretty close to the truth. Okay? There's still, you know, you, you have to do a little more work. Well, quite a bit more work. Not me, but my postdoc student. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? All right?